You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. Hi, everybody. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for June 20th, 2025. This week, I'll take a big deep dive into coronary CTA, FFR CT. It was an eye opener, I have to say. Also, I will discuss a sobering report on the new EVOC tricuspid valve. First, a word of thanks to Shugak Halder and the Royal Brompton team for my invite to the London Arrhythmia Summit. This was a great one day meeting. I don't often stay the whole day after my talk, but it, in this conference, I decided to stay for one lecture. And it was so good, I stayed for another and another. And watching George Klein do his ECG unknowns brought back fine memories of my time at Friday noon conference in the Craner Institute of Cardiology at IU. I now want to uh, issue a correction from last week. Uh, Mark Petrie from the UK writes to correct my description of the Kraft HF trial. I mistakenly said it was surgical versus catheter ablation, but Dr. Petrie said that they were actually randomizing to AF ablation plus HEFREF medical therapy versus HEFREF medical therapy alone in patients with a left ventricular dysfunction. And finally, Saturday, tomorrow, is the first day of summer, and where has the time gone? I have to say that this week is one of my favorite weeks because on our morning ride, there's a spot about halfway through the ride, 20 miles out, and it's in the country, and the sun rises right over a farm on a hill at about 6 a.m. Now, normally this is a hot spot of the ride, but once a year I try to convince the group to just stop and take uh, in the beautiful view and take a photo. All right, first topic today is about imaging and behavior change. Now, my friends in Edinburgh, Scotland, who have been leaders in the use of coronary CTA, report on a nested substudy within the Scott Hart 2 trial. But let's start with Scott Hart 1. It's a good review. Scott Hart 1 randomized uh, symptomatic patients with stable chest pain to receive either CTA plus standard care, which often includes stress testing, versus standard care alone. CCTA-led care led to a significantly lower rate of death from CV death and MI, 2.3 versus 3.9%. This seemed like a huge win for a CTA, but the controversy on Scott Hart 1 centered on the fact that the small delta in statin use in the two groups, there was more in the CTA group, was nowhere near enough to drive the large reduction in MI. For instance, I cited Andrew Foy, who calculated that to believe statin therapy drove Scott Hart results, you'd have to believe statins had an NNT of 3, not its normal 50 to 100. Nonetheless, the use of CTA is different in cost-constrained systems like Scotland. In Scotland, CTA is used to reduce coronary angiography and PCI. Knowledge of CAD is used to guide medical therapy and there is no incentive to do more angiography and more PCI. In the U.S., however, CCTA is used as a cash machine because the nanosecond American patient and American doctor see coronary artery disease, the patient gets a hotline to the cath lab and PCI. Now, the problem, of course, with anatomical testing is that you can have a twinge of chest pain from, say, a cramp, and if you're 60 years old and have incidental CAD, boom, you now have lifelong dependence on antiplatelets for the stents that will be placed. All right, now to the Scott Hart 2 trial, which is an RCT using CTA. The study question is, the screening, is screening with CTA more clinically effective than CV risk scoring with an equation? The plan is to enroll at least 6,000 people, now not patients, people in Scotland who are at risk of heart disease, to one arm, which is CTA-guided management versus the just equation-guided management. They will use an equation called ASSIGN, which is like the PCE, it only uses the outcomes data from Scotland, and it includes a social deprivation score. But the idea is the same. Clinical risk factors come up with a score, and it calculates a 10-year risk. 
Those in the equation or standard care arm get lifestyle advice and lipid-lowering therapy for a 10-year risk greater than 10%. Those in the CTA arm get lifestyle advice for normal CTAs, lifestyle advice plus lipid-lowering therapy and aspirin for non-obstructive disease, and for those who have obstructive disease, they get lifestyle advice, lipid-lowering therapy, aspirin, ACE inhibitor, plus a review by a cardiologist. At five years, the primary outcome of Scott Hart II is coronary death or MI, and they have lots of secondary outcomes. Now, recently, JAMA Cardiology has published a nested cohort study within Scott Hart II looking at a primary outcome of the proportion of participants who achieved the NICE recommendation for diet, BMI, smoking, and exercise. Now, diet, smoking, and exercise were self-reported, and weight, BMI, and step count were measured. This was a small study, included 400 people enrolled over four years. 200 patients in one group, 200 patients in the other group. At six months, those in the CTA screening group were more likely to meet the primary composite endpoint of compliance with the NICE recommendations for diet, BMI, smoking, and exercise. It was 17% versus 6%, which are both pretty low numbers, but of course that's because you had to reach all four of the components. The relative risk increase was an odds ratio of 3.4 times more likely to achieve these four goals if you were in the CTA group. Other secondary findings were that fewer participants in the CTA group were recommended for lipid-lowering therapy, 51% versus 75%. That's because the risk score placed more above 10%, but with normal CTA, lipid-lower therapy was not given. Now, even though fewer uh, lipid-lowering therapies were recommended with CTA, acceptance of lipid-lowering therapy was higher in the CTA group, 77% versus 46%. In the end, though, statistically similar numbers of patients took lipid-lowering therapy in both groups. Antiplatelet use was much higher in the CTA group, 40% versus 0.5%. The authors broke down secondary outcomes based on whether CTA showed disease, and this associated with slightly lower weight, body mass, body mass index, waist circumference, blood pressure, uh, lipid numbers, and a greater improvement in step count. Now, another interesting twist was that 100 individuals in the CTA arm were given a verbal report of their CTA, and 100 were shown their images, and the authors found no difference seen in the two subgroups for the primary and secondary outcomes. I have to say that the authors were pretty calm in their conclusions. They note these interesting observations, that is, that CTA resulted in more accurate risk stratification, where some patients with high equation risk had no disease and some patients with low equation risk had disease, CTA did increase acceptance of lipid-lowering therapy as well as increase the proportion of patients reaching lifestyle goals. The obvious take-home here is that the data supports the seeing-is-believing idea. The editorialists were quite enthusiastic and, re and they wrote that, quote, the results of this RCT within Scott Hart II are striking. They write, a preventive strategy using CTA appeared to be not only more precise, but also more motivating to participants and clinicians. CTA, they note, reclassified one in three individuals based on 10-year risk score, targeting therapy to those who, is, who assume to derive greatest benefit. All right, my comments. I laud the Enberg team for doing Scott Hart too. It's a good trial. It's an important trial. But the differences in verbal acceptance of lifestyle or lipid-lowering therapy or aspirin use or tiny changes in blood pressure or waist circumference, these are not outcomes that we care about. The only outcome that we care about when we're imaging people and putting them in the healthcare system is MI or coronary death. When you submit a person with no disease to medical imaging, it ought not be for motivation. It should only be for health benefit. The changes in lifestyle or drug use or acceptance or more precise risk stratification, these are made up surrogate endpoints that have meaning only if there is a difference in outcomes. I strongly, strongly oppose the use of imaging to scare patients into taking statins or not eating chips. That should not be necessary. Now, in Scotland, the downstream effects of CTA may be much different than it is in the U.S. Here, 
it is highly likely that seeing disease will affect future inter interventions and turn an individual into a patient very quickly. Now, let's say there is mild disease noted on a screening CTA. Maybe the U.S. patient is given statins and aspirin, and they're not sent to a cath lab. Well, what do you think is going to happen in the months or years to come the next time that patient has a twinge of chest pain? It's going to be right to the ER, then the cath lab for stents or bypass. I think we need to celebrate the fact that Scott Hart II will be done, but until then, we need to resist the urge to image our patients based on minor differences in surrogate endpoints, some of which are self-reported. Look, heart disease treatment and prevention is simple. It's lifestyle, including diet and exercise, possibly with lipid-lowering therapy. Imaging is not required and should not be done until there is evidence that it improves outcomes. All right, next topic is more on imaging and the concept of CTFFR. Jack Interventions has published a small research letter looking at the association between cardiac symptoms and coronary plaque. I will call this a back to the future study with modern imaging, and it confirms a lesson that Bernard Lown described a half a century ago. Now, only now we get to toss around terms like fractional flow reserve, total plaque atheroma, and sit down for this artificial intelligence enabled quantitative coronary plaque analysis. Now, I'm going to speak about the letter, which is modest, but the main thing that happened with this letter is that it caused me to look into this whole FFR CT data and OMG. The researchers used data from the Advanced Registry, which was a 5,000 patient registry from multiple centers, done to assess how often FFR CT changes management versus a regular CT. And I'll come back to that. This sample included 4,300 patients who, refer, who were referred for coronary CT and had a coronary lesion. Now, symptoms were characterized into A, squeezing chest pain or neck pain, B, pain precipitated by exertion, C, pain relieved by nitrates or rest. And typical angina had all three of those. Atypical angina had two of the three, non-cardiac had one, and they also had a type of symptom with just dyspnea only. This led to five groups of patients in this study. 25% no symptoms, 10% dyspnea, 6% non-cardiac, 37% atypical chest pain, and only 22% or one in five had typical angina. Okay, now we just pause there and think. The authors had total plaque volume and FFRCT on each of these patients, and then they just did correlations. And they found with these correlations, only typical angina had a positive correlation with plaque atheroma. Typical angina also correlated strongly with negative values or positive values of FFR CT, right? So negative uh, low numbers of FFR is a positive number. The authors also noted, surprisingly actually, that atypical chest pain, non-cardiac chest pain, and dyspnea each correlated slightly, slightly with a higher FFR CT greater than 0.8, suggestive of normal flow. And the authors and imaging proponents seem excited about this. Medscape News covered it, and one of the authors says in the news article, quote, even having no symptoms was not a reliable indicator of cardiovascular health in these patients, quote, just because a patient doesn't report any symptoms doesn't mean there is no atherosclerosis. I know, I know. Hold the presses. Also quoted in a news article, Dr. Matthew Budoff, a cardiologist at UCLA, UCLA, said, quote, cardiologists rely heavily on symptoms to determine how severe cardiovascular disease is, but this new research is beginning to dispel that idea. He added that the new findings support the idea that CT angiography should be a bigger part of the diagnostic process so clinicians can look not only at whether a patient has stenosis, but also go beyond to see if they have any atherosclerosis or plaque that might be a target for medical therapy. Okay, okay, my comments. This letter seems so funny to me. One of the first lessons we were taught at Indiana in the 1990s, before many of you were born, was that when a patient presented with typical angina and even a positive stress test, that catheterization would show left main or severe disease about 10%. It'd be normal in 10% and somewhere in between that in 80%. In other words, symptoms are a very unreliable marker of CAD. 
Now we have a study that uses AI, CT, FFR, and multivariable regression to confirm that something that's as old as the hills. And I do not agree with Dr. Budoff that cardiologists rely heavily on symptoms, at least not many places in the U.S. The main requirement for a stress test in the U.S. is insurance coverage, and the main requirement for a cat is a wrist. We don't rely on symptoms. We rely on imaging and angiography. I have this saying that I don't, <laughs> that I don't say too much anymore, but often in private, but 